Praise God. Thank you for coming out this weekend. Uh, we feel like it's an important time for us to observe together. Um, obviously, you see the boxes available here. Uh, tonight at the end of the service, you'll be able to pick them up out in the lobby. I'll be giving further instruction at that time. I do want to say something. I want to preface tonight before we get into this message. The Bible tells us, Apostle Paul receives revelation from the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John also receives the same revelation about Satan being the god of this world. Now, that's a small g, okay? And because he still is the god of this world, don't get confused with it. The day's going to come when Jesus is going to return, and that's going to change. But the fact of the matter is, Adam and Eve, when they betrayed God, turned on him, literally took if you want to put it in legal terms, took the lease to this planet and gave it to Satan. And so ever since that time, because God honors our free choice, and Adam did that as an act of his will, we live on a planet that someday will be completely under the control of God Almighty. Amen. But right now, there is an entity that has influence in the atmospheres of this world. I hope you're getting this. I hope you're understanding it. Okay. And as such, you and I, the church, the ecclesia, the ones that are called out of that world system which is dominated by Satan, you and I have the responsibility and the empowerment to take authority over the God of this world because we are God's occupying force operating behind enemy lines. That's probably the best way you can describe the position of the church right now. And I hope you understand this, okay? You and I have authority. You and I need to use that authority. In fact, it's some of the last words that Jesus spoke to the disciples before he ascended to heaven. All authority has been given unto me. Go therefore. What's the therefore? Therefore. Therefore. Because he has authority. We're in him. We're in Christ. How many of you here are in Christ? You, the church. Okay? So you and I have authority. And so we have that power. So every once in a while, you need to check in with the Holy Ghost, especially if you're starting to feel like something doesn't feel right. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you have ever had that happen? Like you go in and about your day, um, or you could be woken in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden you perceive something's not right. And it has nothing to do with the natural. It had also to do with the supernatural. The Spirit of God trying to get the church aroused and ready to go and empowered and motivated to go and take authority over the enemy over something that might be being plotted and conspired in the realms of darkness. Pastor, you're scaring me. Don't get scared. The devil's way more scared of you than we should be of him. He knows where he's heading. He knows the power of the church. He knows when a group of individuals will stand on the word of God, commanding darkness to be bound in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, darkness has to listen. So we're in very perilous times right now. We are literally living in the times that the apostle Paul spoke of when he wrote letters to Timothy and wrote letters to, to the churches that he was instrumental in founding and telling them, take your place. Use that authority. Okay, we're living in perilous times, treacherous times. That word, the, the Lord wrote, that, that word rose up in me a couple of days ago. And I thought to myself, my God, what a great description of the times that we're living in right now. Treacherous, treacherous. Now, listen to me, okay? I know you say, oh, here he goes again. We're living in times where the church needs to be the church. Amen. Now, those times require us to know our Savior Amen. and to really hear his voice and to be able to distinguish his voice because we're living right now, you and I are alive on this planet right now at a time probably the most deception that's ever taken place on a global scale is happening right now. And the church is the only one that has the capacity 
to hear from the Holy Ghost so that the Holy Ghost can tell us, don't believe this, don't believe that, don't believe what you're seeing, don't believe what you're hearing, stick close to me, I'll show you how to pray, I'll show you how to walk through these times, I'll show you how to navigate through this, okay? Because listen, there is a world out there that has been kidnapped by Satan. You and I were amongst that group at one point in time. Kidnapped. Now, every human being that exists on the planet right now, ever has existed, ever will exist, is potentially a child of God. I say potentially. Not every individual that lives on the planet right now is a child of God. Every individual is a creation of God. And when he created us, he gave us the faith that we would need to make the choice to become a child of God. Amen. Are you getting that? Is that clear? Amen. So you and I need to be very, very aware, very alert, not paranoid, not fearful, but very much in tune. That's the word I'm looking for. Very much in tune with the Spirit of God. Because you see, if you're born again, you got the Holy Ghost living in you. If you're born again and you got the Holy Ghost living in you, guess what? The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. And he empowers us. He revitalizes us. He brings us into a, a whole new realm of the spirit as it pertains to our position in, in the kingdom of God. Listen to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Listen to the voice of the spirit. Listen to the voice of the word. The word of God has a voice that cries out unto us. And whatever the Lord tells you to do, if the Lord stops you and tells you to pray, pray. Say, well, I don't know what I'm praying about. If you can pray in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you haven't received that gift yet, I would advise you we're living in a day and a time right now where we need every facet of what Jesus purchased for us on the cross in operation in our lives. Amen. Say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, if you want to stay afterwards, we'll talk. See, the born-again experience prepares us for heaven. Can't get to heaven without being born again. Everybody know that? How many people know you can't get to heaven unless you're born again? You've got to have Christ living in you. Amen. Now, that prepares us for heaven. But there's an experience that took place, and it's in the book of Acts, after salvation. That's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Where the power of the Holy Spirit comes up upon us, and that equips us for service here on the earth. He said, you shall be my witnesses when you receive that power. He told the disciples of Jerusalem. So the born-again experience prepares us to heaven, but it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost that prepares us for earth. Amen. And right now, where are we? A couple of people not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> right now, where are we? Okay, our, our salvation has been secured. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. But you and I need to take hold of, now that you're born again, See, anybody could be saved, but not everybody could receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A person that doesn't know Christ cannot receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay, you get born again first, and then the secondary experience, which is separate from the other one, is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is the doorway into the supernatural. And listen to me, okay? I'm sorry if you've been brainwashed along the ways to make you think that you're a weak old worm in the dust, that you're unworthy, that you don't... Yeah, we are unworthy. We don't deserve anything that God's done for us. But he calls us righteous. Amen. Are you getting this? Yes. Okay. Uh, he calls us righteous. He puts us in that position. And in that position, we are expected to operate supernaturally in a very natural world. Okay? Uh, Raina referred to last Wednesday night and if you don't come on Wednesday nights, you're missing it. Make sure if you can't get here, I understand people's schedules are different. If you can't get here, listen to the teaching online. A statement popped out of my heart Wednesday night. God has deposited faith in us in order to overcome the adversity of this life. Adversities are going to come. How many have had a couple? Just a few. Adversity is going to come. The things that are going to cause you to overcome the adversity is not you begging God, not you crying all night long, not you trying to make deals with God. You get the power to overcome adversity when you stand in faith and operate in faith and say, thus saith the Lord, this is written. 
Okay, and you quote the word of God against that adversity and you stand in faith and that adversity has got to turn around. It's got to change. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, according to John. Amen? Amen. So, when you, now, now I, I said everything I said to get to this point. You know, I got to move now because you guys took too much time already in the service. <laughs> Listen, be sensitive to the seasons and be sensitive to not your emotions, but spiritual impressions. We're living in times where there's probably more demonic activity operating on this planet since Jesus was on the earth. Okay? Now, that realm exists right around us. That's why you see so many people going crazy. That's why you see such ridiculous degeneracy in our culture. That's why you see the horrible atrocities that took place a month ago in the nation of Israel. Nobody could do that on their own. Mankind, apart from the devil's influence, does not have the ability to think about how, uh, how to do these atrocities. So we're living in those days. But this is the time when the church needs to rise up even stronger than ever before. Amen. This is a time when we don't just get fearful, huddling in our homes, building bomb shelters in our backyard. Okay, it's time for the church to rise up. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. This is a spiritual battle that's going on. Amen. You're seeing it manifested before your eyes in the nation of Israel. It is not a battle for territory. It's not a battle for whose religion is right. It's a battle in the spirit realm. And it's going to determine the timing of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You got weak on that one. I, I'm, I'm stunned by how many Christians do not have an awareness of the times that we're in. That literally Jesus could appear in the air at any moment. There's absolutely nothing else that needs to happen before the rapture and the catching away of the church. There's a whole lot that's going to happen after it. But right now, this, you know, we, we should have an urgency. We should have an expectation. We should be looking out the window. We should be getting up in the middle of the night looking out the window. He said he's coming for those who expect him. I don't know about you. I'm expecting him. He can come at any time. I'm not holding on to anything. I won't even turn around. I won't be like Lot's wife. I won't even turn around. Just, Lord Jesus, what took you so long? Amen? Amen. So we're finishing up this series, and you're going to see a tremendous miracle take place tonight. Tremendous miracle. Say, what's that, Pastor? You're going to see a 45-minute message be reduced to about 20 minutes. Amen? Amen? Say, well, what's the rush? Well, you know, you can't do everything in every service. I hope you understand that. I, I, I imagine that you guys are... Uh, mature enough to realize that. Every service is unique. Like I said earlier, every service, the Holy Ghost knows who's going to be here, knows what needs to be dealt with. So sometimes in a service, it might be emphasis on this thing and not so much on the other. And other times, it emphasis on that. Now, we always teach. Amen. Okay? And again, like I said, a few, few, I don't remember, it was last weekend or Wednesday night, we are a teaching church. Amen. I think I said it last weekend. We are a teaching church. But unfortunately, many of you show up without the curriculum. Now, either get on your phone. If you have a Bible app, if you don't, you could find something on your phone. You need to see the word for yourself, okay? Uh, preferably, if you could bring your Bible, because you, you, you can write in your Bible. I said that one time, and I heard a lady gasp many years ago. <gasps> Because she, you know, her mindset was the big St. Joseph Catholic Bible on the <laughs> coffee table, about 50 pounds, sacred, covered in plastic. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Pages all stuck together because everybody's afraid to open the thing. Get yourself a Bible you can write in. That becomes your journal. That becomes your journey of faith. You can go back and look. I've got about three or four Bibles now. That over the years, when you get worn out, you get another one. Then I try to go back and take all the notes out of that one and put it in the current one. Because you can, you can literally look back on what God's done in your life. Amen? Amen? So, so you're going to start bringing your Bibles? Yes. Oh, boy, you really got th very enthusiastic. <laughs> we'll give you an extra chocolate chip cookie if you bring your Bible. Gold star on your lapel. 
We've been focusing on the most precious gift that God could ever give mankind, and that is Jesus. God himself in the flesh, I'm moving fast. Just let me, let me, let me just throw it out there. He is Emmanuel, the God with us. He is the holy lamb of God who suffered and died and rose again to take away our sin. Don't ever forget that. He is the blessed light of the world who brings us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Jesus, the hope of Israel, Yeshua, Messiah of Israel, the light to the Gentiles. Remember, he's the Messiah of Israel, but he is the light to the Gentiles. Amen? Amen. That's us. We're not, most of us here are probably not of natural Jewish descent. He is the manifestation of the love of God to us. He is Savior. He is healer. He is deliverer. He is the one who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. He's our peace. And because he's our peace, because he's our shalom, our wholeness, he brings us stability and security. So we're going to finalize the series tonight. And of course, we're going to end up with an act of compassion, not just talking about compassion. So we're finalizing the series tonight. And I want to do it by reminding us of something that we talked about in part one four weeks ago. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. I'm going to read to you from New Living Translation. It's a little bit easier to understand and stays fairly close to the truth, to the original. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. This is Paul talking about his, his heritage, his past. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For this, for his sake, I have discarded everything else. And this should be where the church is right now, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Okay, I, I want to read verse 8 again. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Why? Because if you got him, you got everything. Amen. 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 So I want to continue here. I'm skipping through some things that in order to get to the place we want to make the point. So we're going to look at one more, one more look at the nature of our Savior, keeping in mind this one particular verse. Because like Paul, we're saying, I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know him more, and I want to know him now in this season. Uh, see, seasons change. Now, he revealed himself to you when you first got born again. Now, that might have been two weeks ago, a week ago, a couple of days ago, but it could have been 40 years ago also. Guess what? He didn't change, but you did. How many know you've changed over, over the years? you changed. Some of you don't want to admit it. You want to live in denial. That's okay. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. I want to know him now Amen. in this season. Yeah. I want my soul where my soul... Oh, listen to This is good. i got to say so myself. <laughs> my soul has changed over the years. Hasn't yours? Yes. Okay. My soul has changed over the years. My soul... Now, my spirit is sealed in Christ. Amen. My spirit is as perfect now as it's ever going to be. Not because of me, but because he perfected us. Hebrews chapter 10. Amen? Amen? Okay, now watch this now. My soul has changed over the years. We've been together 46 years. We exchanged personalities back and forth about three times over that. You see what I'm saying? So watch now. My soul now has to learn how to live in 2023. Now, the revelation I had of Jesus in 1984 got me into the kingdom. But I, you and I need a revelation of who Jesus is to us now. I need to know him now. My soul needs to be exposed to him now so that my soul can gain wisdom, can gain strength, can be reminded of things that the Lord has spoken to me, which is one of the things that Jesus said the Holy Ghost would do. John chapter 14, 15, 16. He said he would remind you of the things that I've spoken to you. Most of us have probably forgotten most of the things that the Lord has spoken to us over the years. But the Holy Spirit will remind him. I need him to remind me now in 2023. Are you listening to me? Yes. Because I'm living in a different world than I lived 40 years ago. Your soul needs to, needs to know him now. So that you can navigate through the craziness of this world, the darkness of this world. 
We're living in the last days. Mankind has ever lived through this before. So we need to know, Jesus, what do you have for me now? You listening? I'm going to keep going. I got it. Matthew chapter 9. So we're going to look at one more time at the nature of our Savior, but we're going to do it through the eyes of this particular verse. Matthew 9, verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness. I'm going to take a 30-second little side trip here, a little side journey. Okay, listen to me. Is Jesus different today than he was then? In fact, Hebrews chapter 13 tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes or no? He's the same. I am the Lord, I change not. Amen? Amen? So if Jesus was teaching and preaching and healing then, what do you think he wants to do through his church today? Because we are the body of Christ. So then the body of Christ should be teaching, preaching, and what? Healing. Healing. We should be active in those things. Not every once in a while, you know, I went to the hospital and I had a couple of goosebumps and I think maybe I should have prayed for this person. No, we're supposed to be active. Amen. We're supposed to be looking for opportunities all the time. Yes. Not when you just get trapped. You know, you walk in to visit somebody, they're not there, the other person's in the other bed. They need healing just like the person you're going to visit. Yes. True. Preaching, teaching, healing. Yes. Pastor, I want to be just like Jesus. Okay. Teaching, preaching, healing. Well, I don't know if I have that gift. Well, then you don't know Jesus. Because one of the last things he said to the church before he sent it to heaven was, lay hands on the sick, and maybe once in a while you get one. What do you say? Lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That command was given to the church. Hallelujah. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Verse 36, now you need to see him through these eyes. But when he saw the multitude, say it nice and loud with me, one, two, three, he was moved with compassion for them. Why? You don't have to repeat it. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Life was beating them up. And then no one to rescue them, no one to heal them, no one to care for them, no one to give them an encouraging word. And it broke his heart. In the Old Testament, one of the titles of Almighty God is El Racham. Racham is connected to the Hebrew word for the word womb. So in ancient Hebrew, the concept of compassion is compared to the relationship between the mother and an unborn child. You know, there's a difference between the relationship with an unborn child than when the child is born. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Pastor, I, I, you know, I went through that, and I loved my child. You loved your child, but you weren't connected physically anymore. Yeah. In the womb, the child is connected physically to the mother, Amen. gains all of the nutrients from the mother, gains uh, the, the, the ability to fight disease in the future from the mother. It's a close, close bond. And isn't it interesting that the word in Hebrew for compassion is tied to that same concept. He is connected to us. We are in the body of Christ. We are in him. He's in us. His spirit dwells within us to keep us connected. There should be no separation. We should never have a day where we feel like, I don't know, I don't know, God feels like he's a thousand miles away. Okay, that's a lie from the enemy. Why? Because you're connected. He's got compassion upon you. Amen. Not just pity. Amen. Compassion. We'll talk about that. It's demonstrated for us in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 1. In those days, the multitudes being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciple to him, Disciples him and said, I have, I have compassion. I'm connected to these people. What hurts them hurts me. 
Are you getting their suffering, hunger? It's affecting me. I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own homes, they will faint on the way, for some have come from afar. He's got compassion. Look, look, look like a mother, he's carrying. Listen to me. He's carrying the needs of the people. He carries your needs. The Bible tells us we don't have a high priest that's not affected by the things that we go through in this world. It says he's very much affected by these things, but without sin. You listening? All right. It was the force of compassion that motivated Jesus to multiply seven little small loaves of bread and a few fish multiplied it to enough to feed 4,000 people. It was compassion. It was that I can't let them just go. I can't just let them go. Fine, yeah, I might have, I might have finished what I wanted to say, but they're going to faint on the way. I don't want them to suffer that. You getting this? Yes. It is this constant flow of compassion that we see drawing people to Jesus over and over again. Matthew 14, 14, and when Jesus went out and saw a great multitude, he was, here it goes again, he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Amen. Compassion is a force that motivates action. You might want to write that one down. Compassion is a force that motivates action, while pity merely, merely feels sorrow for the situation. There's a big difference between, we don't need pity. No. We don't, pity will cripple you. Pity, pity does not have within it the empowerment to change your situation. It's just a, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I feel bad for you. You feel bad for me. Do something about it. Yeah. Compassion has the action to change the situations. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. I want you to really listen to this one because I'm going to have to wrap this up soon. I think this is probably one of the most powerful powerful demonstrations and illustrations of the compassion of Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying, now listen to me, look at me, look at me. Don't dare go, I know this story. Don't dare go, oh, I'm going to hear this story again. Listen, I want you to, come, I want you to focus on every word because there's stuff in here that if you're not careful, it'll go. Whoosh. Watch this. Now a leper came to him, imploring him. What is that? What is imploring? Like begging, probably with tears and, and just groveling in the dirt, kneeling down to him and saying to him, Watch this. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Now stop there. It is very obvious that he does not know Jesus to the full extent. He knows he can but he's not sure if he will. So watch this now. He obviously has heard that Jesus has worked other miracles. So he knows Jesus is capable. He just doesn't know if he's willing to do it for him. And how many times has the devil used that lie in our hearts? Yeah, well, you know, you know God worked that miracle for so-and-so, but mm, I don't know about you. You know, she, she's a much nicer person than you are. He's a much better Christian than you are. And you start going, yeah. <laughs> Watch what happens. So we have a leper that's come to him. Leprosy was, is a horrible disease. Horrible disease. It, 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 it runs rampant. Okay, we say, well, we defeated that disease. Yeah, maybe here. But I remember probably about 10 years ago, our son Mark and his wife Lindy went on a missions trip to Ethiopia. Some of you were here, you might remember, we raised, I don't know, $10,000 or something to buy beds for an orphanage out there. And they, they were brought to a place where they said, you have to wear shoes. You cannot go barefoot in this area because it was a leper colony and the leprosy literally got into the dirt and the ground and said, you cannot go there barefoot. Horrible disease. Probably say, oh, I can't believe there's leprosy today. Oh, it exists. It exists. Amen? So he's a leper. Now, if you're a leper in ancient times, it's a serious situation. We'll talk about it some more. So watch this now. He comes to him. He's imploring, kneeling before him. If you are willing, you can make me clean. 
Verse 41, I'm going to read through it, and then we're going to go back because I want you to get everything out of this. Then Jesus, would you say those next three words? Moved with compassion. Watch this now. Stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and told him, don't speak to anybody else. Now watch this now. This man's a leper. By law, a leper is forbidden to come in close contact with another non-leprous person. The law required any leper coming near a person to declare at the top of his lungs, unclean, unclean. In other words, get out of the way. Don't touch me. Don't come near me. And this has been going on for years. This guy has gone for years without any human contact, without any human touch. On the outside, you saw the leprosy, and Jesus is going to deal with the leprosy. But on the inside, Jesus sees a soul that's been destroyed, damaged, isolated, rejected, abandoned. And Jesus, in his wisdom, knows What good is it for me to heal the outside if I don't heal the inside? So, oh my God, are you getting this? So the very first thing he does before he speaks to the leprosy, what's the first thing he does? Touch. Touch. My God, can you imagine what that must have did for this man? Nobody has touched this guy. Nobody has come within 10 feet of this man. For God knows how many years. His heart has shrunk. His soul has shrunk is so damaged. And the first thing that Jesus does, the compassion. Compassion. See, leprosy is nothing to him. But this man not only had the skin-eating disease, he had a disease that destroys the soul. And his very first act in the miraculous healing of this man is what? Could, I, I don't know about you, but I could just imagine that man recoiling like, don't, t- don't touch me. What are you doing? Somebody's going to see this. We're going to get reported to the religious people. Pulling back, and Jesus is grabbing his shoulder and just come here. Moved with compassion, not just pity. That is the Savior that went to the cross on our behalf. Not just so we wouldn't go to hell but that our souls would know him again, that our soul would experience his love, that our soul would be reconnected to God our Father. Are you listening to me? Last week, or was the last week or the week before, we talked about how Jesus takes what's ordinary and makes it extraordinary. There's nothing magical about these boxes. We got the cute little marshmallows. We have gravy mix. We've got macaroni and cheese. We've got the stuffing, shortcut stuffing. I mean, I was talking about taking the shortcuts. Turkey gravy, mashed potato mix. We even got syrup and pancake mix so the kids could have pancakes for breakfast. It's ordinary. Nothing, nothing supernatural about this until, until you allow Jesus to take this box and bring it to somebody who's been not able to sleep because they don't know where the Thanksgiving dinner is going to come from. You have the opportunity this weekend to operate in compassion, and I wish the box would cooperate with me. He takes what's ordinary and makes it extraordinary. You listening to me? Well, I don't know. I don't know who to give it to. Pray. Maybe, maybe you need it. We're not going to ask you where you're going to do with it. So you could come and with full dignity go out in that lobby and take one of those, take a turkey, take it home. God bless you. But maybe your needs are already taken care of for this year, for Thanksgiving. But I'll guarantee you, you know somebody who's in need. I pray that you have the boldness. 
I pray that you have the courage to put. We had somebody a few years ago, probably about five years ago, took one of the boxes, didn't know who they were going to give it to. They prayed, and literally, God gave them an address to go to. That's where they got. They went to that house, dropped off the box, dropped off the turkey. We get a phone call a couple days later. The person was somebody who came to church here, but the person didn't know that. The one who brought it didn't know that. Now watch. They took a box and brought it to somebody else, but they needed a box for themselves, but they chose to give it to somebody else, and God leads the person to their house and brings one of the boxes and brings the turkey. You think he doesn't know where you live? (laughs) He takes what is ordinary and makes it extraordinary. Touch somebody's life. And don't judge my appearance. Well, they got a nice car, they got a nice house. You don't know what's going on on the inside. Oh, that person probably doesn't need it. They're dressed better than I am. Doesn't mean a thing. Doesn't mean a thing. So, we have to, we got to go. Okay? The teachers are in there with your kids. Okay? They're expecting the service to be over. Here's what I'd like. I'd like for you as many as you want to participate, come up here and lay hands on these boxes so that we can pray over them and watch them go from ordinary to extraordinary. We're going to pray over them and watch them become an instrument of compassion in the hands of Jesus. Now, if you're going to take a box, take it from the lobby on your way out. But if you want to come up and pray with us, come and pray with us. The rest of you, you're dismissed if you need to leave. Just sit in front of here and just lay hands on these boxes. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, God. Go right ahead and pray. You don't need me to pray. Go right ahead and pray.